Uh, so far, we've created this application with some good functionality, but the site still only lives on our local machine. Uh, right now, this is just running in my browser on my local machine, but no one else can access this. So the point of building these sites is to deploy them so that they're accessible over the internet. Now, look, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, deploying is a bit tricky. Uh, you can find a lot of Django tutorials online, but not many of those cover deployments, and that's because they can be difficult. Uh, it can be overwhelming because there's a lot of different ways to deploy an application, and it's hard to know what's best for your specific application. Uh, so we're going to look at several deployment options in this series. So we'll look at how to deploy to your own Linux server, how to deploy to Heroku, how to deploy to Python Anywhere, and possibly some others. In this video, we'll be learning how to deploy our our application to our own Linux server. So when you deploy to a Linux server, you're most likely going to be deploying to a virtual machine that is hosted by a company. So that's going to be a company like Linode or DigitalOcean or AWS. Uh, I personally use Linode for my own web applications. So that's what we're going to be using in this video. Uh, and Linode was actually kind enough to sponsor this video and has provided me with a link where you can get $20 of free credit towards an account. Uh, so if you want to follow along with this video, then I'll leave that link in the description section below where you can sign up for an account and get enough credit to follow along. So I've been using their services for my own personal website for years. So I was really happy when they contacted me about sponsoring a video. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so like I said, we're going to be deploying to a Linux server. So this method of deployment actually takes the most effort to set up, but is also the most flexible in terms of what control you're going to have over your application and web server. So in future videos, we'll look at deployment options that offer some free tiers, but they usually only offer basic services. So for example, if you want to use your own domain name, such as myjangoblog.com or something like that, then you'll have to upgrade to a paid service on those free options in order to set that up. And even then you won't have the freedom or possibilities that you get with having your own virtual private server. Uh, so the way that we're doing it in this video will give you a lot of freedom and room for your application to grow, but it's not as simple as some other methods. So there's definitely some trade-offs there. Okay, so first things first, for those of you who have been following along with this Django series, I need to make one correction to the actual Django code before we deploy this. It worked in development, but when I tried to deploy the application, it gave me some issues. Uh, so the correction that needs to be made is in our users models.py file. So I'm going to open that up really quick and make a quick change. So I have my application open here in Sublime Text, and this was in, let me uh, maximize this here. This was in our users app here, and this was in uh, models.py. And the mistake that I made was down here in our save method. Uh, so when we're calling the save method on our parent class, this super.save, we need to accept any other arguments that our parent class might be expecting. So in this case, uh, we need to pass in uh, args, which are positional arguments, and quarks, keyword arguments, into that save method. Uh, so to do this, I will just accept uh, positional and keyword arguments here by doing star quarks and star or star args and star star quargs. And we also want to pass those in to our save method whenever we call that on our parent class. So again, what that does is if you've watched my video on functions before, then you'll know that the convention of passing args and quargs to your function allows you to accept any arbitrary number of positional or keyword arguments. Um, okay, so with that correction in place, let's now deploy our application. So like I said, I'm gonna be using Linode to deploy this application to a Linux server. That's my personal preference, but you can do this uh, same deployment with any Linux server that can that you can access via SSH. Now, I already have an account with Linode, so let me go ahead and pull that up here in my browser. So I have a tab open here, and I'll refresh this page. So if you create an account with them, then you should be able to access a page like this as well. This is their new cloud manager, and that's at cloud.linode.com. Uh, now, there's also a Linode manager at manage.linode.com, but that's older, and I believe they're now steering people towards using this instead. So this page gives me access to all of my current Linode servers. So you can see I already have one created for my personal website here called CoreyMS-Server. But we're going to create a new one from scratch to deploy our Django application. So let's go ahead and see what this process is like. So first, I'm going to come up here to Create, and we're going to click on Create, and we want to create a new Linode. Linode is their name for their, you can see here it says High Performance SSD Linux Servers uh, for all your infrastructure needs. So we're going to click on that to create a new Linux server. 
And now we need to select what image we want to create uh, with this server. So I'm going to use Ubuntu uh, server in this video, uh, but depending on what your preference is, you can use any of these. Uh, CentOS might be another option or Fedora, but I'm gonna choose Ubuntu. So for the region, I'm gonna come down here. I'm just gonna pick Dallas, Texas. It's a nice midpoint in the United States. Uh, you can see that they also have some regions in Europe and Asia as well. Uh, so depending on where people are gonna be accessing your application, you might want the server to be served up to them from a close location. So for this application here, I'm just gonna choose Dallas, Texas, that's fine. So down here for the Linode plan, uh, this is where you pick how much performance you want in your machine. And you can see the prices are attached here. So this one is $10 a month. This one is $20 a month. Now, this is their standard plan here. They also have something called a Nanode here. And if we click on that, you can see that this is a pretty low performance machine. It's just got one CPU, uh, 25 gigs of storage and a one gig of RAM, but it's only $5 a month. And our application, especially if you're just testing, uh, most likely isn't going to be very uh, intensive. So I'm just gonna pick their cheapest option for deploying our Django application. Now you can always resize these later. So I'd just suggest going small at first. And if you want to bump it up to something bigger, depending on you know how much traffic you're getting, then you can do that at a later time. Uh, okay, so down here at the label, I'm just going to call this uh, Django-Server. Okay, so for the tags, I'm just gonna leave that empty there. So now we need to choose a root password. So this is going to be the root password on the server. So you're gonna to wanna to pick something secure. Um, for me, I'm just going to uh, put in a password of this is a test. Now I'm gonna delete this server after this video. So you know, you're not gonna be able to log into my uh, server as a root or anything like that. Now, whatever password you choose here, be sure that you remember this because this is the root password on your server and you're definitely going to need to know it whenever you first log into your computer. Uh, so, you know, definitely remember this uh, for later uh, because we are going to be using that. So now that we have that, I'm just going to go over here and click create. And now it's going to create our server for us. So you can see here that our Django server, it says that it is provisioning the server and now it is booting up. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward to where this machine is fully created, uh, but it shouldn't take too long, just a couple of minutes. Okay, so once our server has completed booting up, uh, we can see our server here within our list of Linodes. Uh, we can also go to our dashboard and see it here. Um, now, if we click on our Linode, then it'll give us more options with this. So click on that Django server that you just created, whatever you named it, and now go to the networking tab. So we can see that we have a lot of tabs here, summary, volumes, networking, uh, settings, everything like that. Let's click on networking. And down here we see access. And the first thing it says here is SSH access. So let's copy this because we're gonna SSH into this machine. So you're gonna to wanna to copy that SSH command and paste it into your command line to SSH into your newly created server. Now, if you're on Windows, then you won't have access to the SSH command in the command line. There are other tools that you can use that allow you to SSH into a server. So one of the more popular ones is called Putty, and I have it here on, uh, I have their website pulled up here. It's at uh, putty.org. And they have documentation in here of how you can SSH into a server. Uh, but personally, what I would recommend on Windows, if you're on a newer version of Windows, is to simply install the Linux Bash shell on Windows, and you're able to use SSH through that. That's what I personally do on my Windows laptop anytime I need to connect to a server. Now, I'm not going to show that process of installing the Linux Bash shell on Windows in this video because I already have a separate video detailing that whole process. So I'll put a link to that in the description section below if anyone wants to watch that. So once you're running Bash, then you should be able to use SSH. And again, if you don't want to use Bash for any reason, then you should install the software called Putty uh, that allows you to use SSH on Windows here at putty.org. But I will say that if you're using a Linux Bash shell, then it'll allow you to more easily follow along with all of the commands in this video. Um, okay, so if you're using Bash, then we'll want to copy this SSH command here for uh, from our networking tab in Linode. And let's paste this into our command line. Now I have two different terminals pulled up here right now. 
Now, one of these I'm going to use to run commands on my local machine, and one I'm going to use to run commands on our remote Linode server. Now, you don't have to do it this way, but if you only use one terminal window, then you'll have to go back and forth between your local machine and your server. So I think it's easier to simply have two windows open. And let me actually minimize our uh, browser here in the background so that we only have our terminal windows open here. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna paste that SSH command into my terminal on the left side here. So on the left, I'm gonna have our remote server and on the right, I'm gonna have our local machine. So I'm going to paste in that command and hit enter. And this is gonna ask you uh, if you're sure that you want to con continue connecting. This is only gonna ask you this the first time. So I'll just say yes. And now it's asking for that root password. This is what we uh, created when we created our Linode. So for mine, I had that as this is a test. So if I insert that password, then we can see that that worked. We are now SSH'd into what is going to be our web server. So you can see that we are uh, root at localhost. So localhost, this is our Linode server. So we are actually in the terminal of that machine. Um, so first, let me clear the output there. Uh, first, let's install some software updates. This is just something that you're going to want to do uh, for the first time that you get onto your Linux machine. Now, I'm actually going to minimize this right side here and uh, expand this over so that we have more room to work with here on our server. Um, so to do this, now remember, I'm on Ubuntu, so I'll say apt get update, and then I will also type in these two ampersands, and then apt get upgrade. And let me make sure I spelled that right. And this is just going to go through and update our machine and make sure that we have all the latest security patches and things like that. It might ask you occasionally if you want to continue. So you might have to hit yes a couple of times through this. And this could also take a little bit of time. Uh, so I'm just going to fast forward into where uh, this is done. Okay, so after a couple minutes, those software updates should complete. Uh, so now I'm going to clear my screen here. Um, so now what we want to do is we want to set the host name of this new machine. So on Ubuntu, we can do that by saying uh, hostname ctl set dash hostname. And now let's put in whatever we want the hostname to be. So I'm just going to say Django dash server here for this machine. And we can check that that worked by typing in hostname, and we should get Django server there. Now, remember, I did use Ubuntu for the operating system for this example, uh, but if you are using something like CentOS or Red Hat, then some of these commands are going to be different. So you're going to have to uh, map the differences between those uh, if you're using a different operating system than what I'm using here in this tutorial. Okay, so now we also need to set the host name in the host file. So to do this, I'm just going to use nano because nano is a simple editor that most people know how to use. So I'm going to say Neto, nano, and this is in the etc directory and this file called host. So I'm going to nano on that. And underneath this 127.0.0.1, I am going to put in the IP address of our server. Now you're gonna need that IP address a lot, so it would probably be a good idea just to write it down. Um, now this is the IP address that we used in our SSH command. Now I think that I still have uh, that command pasted in or copied into my clipboard here, and I do. So I'm just going to get rid of that first part, and there is the IP address that we wanna put in there. So we wanna put in that IP address, and then hit tab. And now we want to put in uh, what we had as our host name. So that was uh, Django dash server. So if I now hit control X and then yes to save, and then just hit enter to keep the same file name. And that should finish up setting the host name. Okay, so now we want to add a limited user. So right now we're logged in as the root user. The root user has unlimited privileges and can execute any command. Now that might sound nice, but it's best practice to add a new user that has limited privileges that you can use as your main account. And you'll still be able to run admin commands using the sudo command. So let's add this limited user. So I'm gonna say add user. And the user that I'm going to create is going to be Corey MS. Now you can put whatever username you want here. Um, so I will hit enter there. And now it's asking us to put in a password. So again, I'm just going to say this is a test with a few capitalizations in there. Uh, same password again. 
And now it's going to ask you to fill out a little bit of information like your full name and stuff like that. This is actually optional. You don't have to do this. So I'm going to put in my full name, but for the others here, I'm just going to leave blank and hit enter. And then uh, it's going to ask if that information is correct. I'll just accept the default of yes. And that created a new user for us. Now we want that new user to be able to run, uh, you know, root commands. Uh, so we want them to be able to use sudo. So the way, the way we can do that, there I'm going to clear the screen here. The way we can do that is to simply say, uh, add user Corey MS, and then just put sudo after that. And that will, uh, it says here, adding user Corey MS to the group sudo. Okay, so now we have created a new user on this Linux server, and now we can just log in as that user. It's not good practice to log in as root because there's a lot of things that you can mess up that way. Um, so let's exit out of our server. So I'm going to exit, and now let's log back in. But so I just hit up arrow there to log back into our server. But instead of logging in as root, I'm going to log in as Corey MS as the user that we just created. So you want to fill in whatever user you created here. So when we hit enter, it's going to ask for that user's password. And that's what we uh, put in whenever we created the user. Oh, and it looks like I mistyped that. Let me try one more time. Okay, so now we can see that we logged in as our new user. So I'm going to uh, clear our screen here and we can see that we also have our host name there. So now it's saying that that is the name of our server. Okay, so now that we have a user created, uh, now we're gonna wanna set up SSH key-based authentication so that we can log into our server without a password. Um, okay, so at this point, I know that you might be thinking to yourself like, oh, why do I have to do all of this stuff? I just wanna deploy my Django application. Uh, well, the reason that we're doing all of this is because I wanna show you what it's like to deploy a real world application and to put the proper precautions in place on your server from scratch. So that includes best practices like setting up SSH keys and firewalls and things like that. Uh, you're going to want to do that on any real world application that you deploy. So I may as well include it in this tutorial instead of just showing you the bare minimum. So right now, the next best practice that we're going to put in place is using SSH key based authentication to log in instead of passwords. So by default, we're using a password to log in to our web server. We instead want to use key based authentication, and that's more secure and more convenient because it uses keys that can't be brute forced and also allows us to log in without putting in a password every single time. And that's great for, you know, running remote scripts that connect to your web server or anything like that. Now, I have a separate video on SSH key based authentication as well. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of these commands, but we're going to run through all of them here anyway. But if you want to know more details as to what these commands are doing, then you can watch that video and I'll put a link to that in the description section below. Now there's actually an easier way to do this by using a command called SSH copy ID, but it's not available on all operating systems. So instead we're just going to do this the slightly longer way. Um, okay, so we are logged in to our web server as our user that we just created, and we are in the home folder. If I do a PWD, that will print the working directory, and we are currently in our home folder here. So in our home folder, we're going to want to make a directory uh, called .ssh. So I'm going to say mkdir dash p. That means it's going to uh, make the entire tree of the directory. And we want to create that in our home folder. And that's what that tilde is. So home folder, and that is going to be .ssh. So let's make that. And if you do an ls dash la, then we can see that we do now have that ssh folder. So now I'm going to clear my screen there. And now we want to go back to our local machine. Uh, so if you don't have two windows pulled up, then you can uh, simply exit out to get back to your local machine. But I am just going to uh, use uh, this other window terminal here. So here I'm on my local computer. Now, again, I'm doing this in Bash in this tutorial, but if you're using a program like Putty on Windows that we talked about before, then you'll have to do this differently to create and copy your SSH keys to your web server. So I found documentation in Linode's guides for Putty users on how you can do this through Putty. And I'll put a link to that in the description section below as well, uh, so that you can see how to do that using that software. Um, but here in Bash, we can simply say SSH keygen and I'm going to do a dash B and then 
4096. That just makes it a little more secure. Now, remember, we're on our local machine here. And now it says generating public private RSA key pair. Uh, enter the file in which you wish to save that key. And this is in my home folder on my local machine in an SSH directory uh, with an ID RSA file. I'm just going to leave that as the default there. And it's saying that I have one that already exists. So I'm just going to overwrite that with yes and enter a passphrase. So you can also have a passphrase uh, for this key as well. I'm going to leave that empty, but you can add one if you'd like to make it even more secure. Okay, so what that did for us is it created two keys. So we can see that it says your identification has been saved uh, as ID RSA, and then your public key has been saved as ID RSA dot pub. Now what we're gonna to wanna to do is put our public key on the server uh, so that then we can log in uh, without a password. It's gonna be able to recognize us because these two keys are going to match. So let me go ahead and clear the screen here. So now we need to get that public key to our server. Uh, now, if you're on Windows and you're not using Bash, then you can use uh, you know, FTP or FileZilla or something like that where you can drag and drop. Uh, since we're using Bash, we can just simply use an SCP command. So I'm gonna say SCP, and that was created in my home folder in this .ssh directory, and that was called ID underscore RSA dot pub and we want to copy that file up to our server so now i'm going to say core ems but at this point you're going to want to put in the user that you created but i'm using core ems and also now we want to uh, put that ip address so like i said you're going to be using that ip address to your server a lot so it's probably best to write it down so i wrote mine down here mine is 198 dot 58.119.183. So after we specify where we want to copy that uh, public key to uh, the server, now we want to put an exact location in that server. So I'm going to put a colon here, and now we can specify the location on this server that we want to save that public key. So that is within the home directory of this user here. So a tilde there for the home directory, and then dot SSH directory. And let's uh, save this as a file called authorized underscore keys. Now you don't need file extensions on Linux, so we can just call that authorized keys and leave it at that. So I'm going to run that and it's going to ask us for our password because we don't have this set up to uh, use without a password yet. Okay, and we can see that that was copied over. So now I'm going to go back to our server here. So now if I do an ls uh, on our dot SSH directory, then we can see that now we have that authorized key file. Okay, so now just to finish this SSH stuff up, uh, we now need to update some permissions. And again, I can't go into deep detail as to what every command is doing in this video, or else it would just run on for a long, long time. Uh, but basically what we're going to be doing here is setting the permissions for the SSH directory to where the owner of the directory has read, write, and execute permissions uh, on that directory. And the owner of the files in the directory will have read and write permissions on those files. So to do that, we can say uh, sudo chmod, and that's how we change permissions in Linux. And we're going to do 700 permissions, and we're going to do 700 permissions on that SSH directory. So I will run that, and now it's going to ask for a sudo password. So we can put in that password, oh, and it looks like I may have mistyped. And now I'm going to run that same command, but I'm going to do 600 permissions. And I'm going to do a 600 permissions on all of the files within that directory. So I'll run that. And if you use sudo uh, a good bit, then you don't have to put in the password every time. It'll remember it for some time. Now, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here as to what these permissions mean. Uh, but basically on Linux, uh, the way that the permissions work is this first number here is the permissions for the owner uh, of either the directory or the file. The second number here is the permissions for the group. And the third one here is the permissions for everyone else. So what we were saying here with seven is read, write, and execute. And uh, with six here, it's just read and write. And those are just zero permissions for everybody else. Um, okay, so now we should be able to log in without a password. So again, I'm going to exit my machine just to test this. So now we're back on our local machine. So I'm going to hit the up arrow to where we logged in, SSH'd in as our user. And I'm going to hit enter. 
and you can see that it just logged us in without a password there. So our SSH keys are now working and that is also more secure than using a password as well. Okay, so we're just about finished up with the SSH stuff, but there's a couple of more things that are best practices to uh, change here before we finish this out. Um, so first of all, we want to uh, not allow uh, root logins. We just want to be able to log in as our users. And we also don't want to allow password authentication because we just want uh, to be able to log in with key-based authentication. And if somebody needs a password, then it means that they don't have the keys that they need. Uh, so let's just disallow that altogether. And we can do that within the SSH config file. So that is in the location and you have to use sudo here. So we'll do sudo nano. And this was within uh, this etc directory, SSH. And that file is sshd underscore config. So we need to put in our sudo password again. So we're gonna change two things in this configuration file. So first, we are gonna change uh, the permit root login. So if you scroll down a little bit, then you can see that this is the first one uncommented here. And right now it's set to yes. We're gonna set that equal to no. And let's scroll down a little further here. And there should be a commented one that says uh, password authentication. So we can see here, this one is commented out, password authentication. So let's uncomment that. And it's already set to yes. Let's instead set that to no. Um, okay, so now let's save that. So in nano, you hit control X and then a Y to save and then enter just to keep the same file name. And now we need to restart the SSH service. So we can do that with uh, sudo systemctl restart SSH. D. So let's run that and that should have restarted our SSH service. Okay, so we're almost ready to push our Django application. There's just one more thing that we're going to do and that is setting up a firewall, but this is going to be very quick. Um, so first we need to install something. So I'm going to clear my screen. So let's say sudo apt get and we're going to install something called UFW. And UFW stands for Uncomplicated Firewall. This is a lot easier than using like IP tables or something like that. Okay, so now we're just gonna set up a few basic rules. So first we're gonna say sudo UFW uh, default, and we are going to allow outgoing and hit enter there. And now I'm gonna hit the up arrow and I'm gonna put in another rule, and this is gonna be uh, deny incoming. Let me spell that correctly. Deny incoming. Now configuring a default deny rule that denies all incoming traffic uh, can lock you out of your server unless you explicitly allow SSH. So be sure that you've configured these next allow rules uh, for SSH and HTTP before applying our changes. So to allow SSH, you need to say sudo ufw allow, and we can just allow SSH. Okay, so that's good. Um, now I'm not gonna allow HTTP right now. Instead, uh, since we're going to test our site before we actually make it live, I'm just going to allow a certain port. Now, if you remember, our Django development server runs on port 8000. So let's just allow that port for now. And that's how we'll test it on this Linode server. And if it's all working, then we'll allow HTTP over port 80. So I'm going to allow 8000 there. And we can see that these rules were updated. And now we need to enable these. Uh, we're getting a little far down here. So let me clear my screen. Okay, so now we need to enable these. So I'll say sudo uh, UFW uh, I'm sorry, enable, not allow. So sudo ufw enable, I'll run that. And it says command may disrupt existing SSH connections. So hopefully you remembered to allow those SSH connections. So I'm gonna say yes. And now if we do a sudo ufw status, then we can see everything that is being allowed here. So port 22 is SSH and port 8000 here is what we're gonna to use to test our Django application before we make it live on port 80. So I'm going to clear the screen. Okay, so that's gonna finish up all of the new Linux server setup type of stuff. So now we're ready to actually deploy our Django application. So first, we wanna put our application on the web server. Now there are multiple ways that you can get this application to your web server. Uh, so if you have it checked into a Git repository, then you can simply use Git to do a Git clone to our server here. 
Uh, you can use an FTP client like FileZilla to push it to the server. Uh, since we're already in the command line on our local machine, we can just use the terminal command to do this. So I'm going to pull up my other terminal window here where I'm on my local machine and let's clear the screen. Now, before you push your Django application, if you're using a virtual environment for your application, then you're going to want to create a requirements.txt file that captures everything that we need to install for our Django application to work. Now, I was using a virtual environment for this series, so I'm going to activate that and then create a requirements.txt file from that environment. So uh, I am going to activate my virtual environment. So I'm going to say source and that environment lives on my desktop. And this is called Django ENV. And that I have to run, I have to source the activate file. So dash bin dash activate. So now we can see in our prompt here that that Django environment is now activated. Now, if we want to see all of the dependencies that we have for our application, then we can simply run pip freeze. And if we run this, then we can see it uh, displays everything that we're using in this project. So we have Django, Django Crispy Forms, Pillow, uh, and some of these are dependencies on others. So PyTZ uh, is a dependency that Django uses. And you can see that this also provides all of the uh, versions, the exact versions that we were using in development as well. So uh, saving all of these and then installing those on our server uh, should make sure that, uh, you know, no updates or anything are going to break our application because we're installing exactly what we were running in development. Now, if you're on Windows, then you can create a requirements.txt file and then just paste all of this uh, here into it. Uh, but if you're on Mac or Linux or using Bash, then we can simply say, let me clear my screen here. We can simply say pip freeze, and then we can feed that into a requirements.txt file. And that'll that will create a requirements.txt file with the contents, with the output of that pip freeze command. So I will run that. And now we want to put this requirements.txt file into our Django application. Uh, so I am going to open up Finder here, um, and I have two windows opened up. So this is my desktop here. Now let me open up my Django project. So this is my Django project, and this is my desktop. I'm going to, well, I thought I created the requirements.txt file uh, on my desktop, uh, but actually I'm within my home folder instead. Uh, sorry about that. So let me go to my home folder. So here is that requirements.txt file. And I'm just going to drag this over and drop that into my Django project. So now that requirements.txt file is inside of our Django projects. And I'm going to close down uh, those finder windows. Okay, so now we need to put our application onto our web server. Now, since I'm using bash, I'm gonna use the same SCP command that we used earlier to copy our uh, SSH keys. But if you're not using bash, then again, you can use something like FileZilla or Git to get your project uh, folder onto the server. Okay, so to do this, uh, first I'm gonna to navigate to my desktop because that is where my Django project currently lives. And that project is called Django underscore project. So now I'm going to say SCP, uh, which will copy. And we need a dash R here to do a, a recursive copy. That means that we can copy a directory. Um, so now I will do uh, Django underscore project. That's what we want to uh, copy to our server. And we want to copy this to uh, Corey MS at, now you want to use whatever user you created there, and now the IP address. So again, I wrote this down. You want to use your IP address. Mine is 198.58.119.183. And again, to specify an exact location on that server, we can put a colon. And I'm just going to put this in the home folder on uh, for this Corey MS user. So after the colon, I'm just going to put a tilde and a forward slash, and that should put it in the home folder on that server. So I'm going to run that. Okay, and that copied everything from our Django project onto our server. So now let me minimize our local machine here and go back to our server that we still have open in this terminal window. 
And now let me do an ls on the home directory to make sure that that copied over. And we can see that it did. We have our Django project here. And if we do an ls on Django project, then we can see that it has all of our applications. So it's got the main Django project here, the users, the blog, and our uh, SQLite file, everything. Okay, so now that we have our Django application on our web server, now we're ready to actually get it running on here. Uh, so first of all, let's create a virtual environment that is going to run our application. Uh, so to do this, we're going to need to install a couple of things. So I'm going to say sudo apt git install, and we want to install. So first I'll install Python 3 dash pip. Now you want to do the Python 3 dash pip because if you don't put the three there, it'll do Python version two. So we'll do a sudo install of Python 3 dash pip. Now some of those installations can take a bit. Uh, so instead of watching the entire installation throughout these videos, I'm just fast forwarding to where these are complete. Uh, so if you're following along and yours is still installing, then you can just pause the video until yours is done as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to clear my screen here and now let's install uh, Python 3's virtual environment. Uh, so I'll say sudo apt-git install and this is gonna be Python 3 dash v e n v and i will say yes there okay so once that is finished installing now i'm going to create a new virtual environment uh, now you can create this virtual environment anywhere that you want but i'm going to put this inside of our django project folder so to create a virtual environment we can simply say python 3 dash m v e n v and I'm gonna put this within our Django project folder, and I'm going to call this virtual environment just simply VENV. -E so now if I do an LS on our Django project, then we can see that we have a virtual environment right here. So now let's activate that virtual environment so that we can install all of our dependencies. So I'm going to CD into our Django project directory, and within here, I'm going to say source VENV -E bin, activate and that should activate our vir virtual environment we can see here at the beginning of our prompt we now it now says venv so that's a good sign that our virtual environment is activated okay so now i'm going to install all of those dependencies from our requirements.txt file and remember our requirements.txt file we just put that here within our django project so we can simply say pip install and if we do a dash R on pip install, then it'll expect a requirements.txt file. So we can say requirements.txt and run that. And it's going to go through and install everything in that requirements file. So it's going to install Django and PyTZ and uh, crispy forms and all of that. Now, if you didn't create a requirements.txt file, then at that step, you still want to create the virtual environment, but you're just going to install those manually. So you just install the uh, version of Django that you used in the series, and then Pillow and Crispy Forms and all of the other uh, packages that we use throughout the series. Okay, so now that we have all of that installed, let me clear my screen here. Um, now let's change some settings in Django so that we can test this on our Linode server. So first, I'm gonna open up our settings.py file. Now that is located, so I'm gonna do a sudo nano, that is located inside of Django project settings.py. So I will run that. And there are a couple of things that we need to change here. So I'm gonna go down here a little bit and we should see something called allowed host. Now allowed host, we need to put in our IP address of our server. Now, if you have a domain name, then you can use the domain name as well. But for now, we just have the IP address. Now this is gonna be a string. So uh, I wrote my IP address down, you would insert yours here, but mine was 198.58.119.183. Now you have to have that in allowed host because for security reasons, uh, Django isn't going to allow traffic uh, anywhere that it doesn't recognize the host. Um, okay, so now with that in place, now let's scroll down towards the bottom here where we put, uh, okay, so here at the bottom, I wanna scroll up just a little bit to our static URL. 
So if you remember earlier in the series, I said that static files were handled differently in development than they are in production. Uh, so in production, we have to put in a place where these static files are going to exist. And that's going to be the static root. So right above the static URL here, I'm going to put static underscore root. And I'm going to set this equal to, uh, th for me, I'm just going to put os.path uh, dot join and I'm going to put this in the base directory so base dir it's actually going to be very similar to our media folder here so it's going to be in the base directory of our project and instead of media we will do static so once we've made those changes to our settings uh, let's save those so I'll hit control X and then Y to save and then enter to keep that same file name so now to get our static files working here on the server, we need to run a command called uh, collect static. So I'm going to say Python manage.py and that is collect static. So if we run that, then we can see that it says 120 static files copied to uh, this static directory here within our Django project. So if I do an ls now, then we can see that now we have a static folder here within our Django project. Okay, so now let's test this. So let's run our development server, but we're going to open it up on our Linode server here to where we can access it from the outside. So I'm going to say Python manage.py run server. Now don't hit enter yet. Uh, we want to do the address of 0.0.0, .0, .0 and then colon port 8000. Uh, remember that we opened up port 8000 on this server. Uh, sorry this is going to the uh, next line here, uh, but hopefully you can read that all right. So if I hit enter there, then it says that uh, our server is running. And since we specified this as 0.0.0.0, .0 .0 .0, uh, that should allow us to go to our IP address on port 8000 and see this development server running. So I'm going to open uh, Chrome back up and see if we can access this. So my IP address was 198.58.119.183. And to go to port 8000, we can put in a colon and then 8000. So if I run that, then we can see that our blog is uh, now available through our browser. So this should be accessible to anybody. So you could send somebody your IP address and that port, and they should be able to go to your blog and interact with it. Um, so let's test the site. So if I go here to create a new user, let's try to create a new user. So I'll do uh, test four and an email of test four at test.com, a random password, and let's sign up. And we can see that our user has been created. Let's try to log in with that user. So test for, and then the password that we used. So we can see that we can log in. It gives us a default uh, profile here where it has all the information that we uh, entered. So let's test that we can create a new post. So test post test content. If we post that, then it looks like our post was created. Um, let's try to update a post. So I will do test updated post, and that seems to work. Um, let's try to delete a post, and that seems to work as well. Um, let's try to update our profile picture. You want to be sure that you test a good bit of functionality uh, just to make sure that it all seems to be working properly. Uh, so let's update a profile picture. And that seems to work as well. Um, let's test the logout. Okay, and the logout works. And lastly, let's test the admin page. So I'm going to go to forward slash admin and then put in uh, the user I created with admin access is Corey MS. And I will log in here. Okay, and it looks like our uh, admin page works as well. Um, so now I'm going to log out of there. Okay, so it seems like most of our functionality is working on our server now. So that is a really good sign. Now, one bit of functionality that isn't going to work yet is our forgot password functionality. So if I go to forgot password and try to reset my password, then it's going to give me an error. And the reason is, is because we haven't copied over our environment variables from our local machine that contain our email service username and password. 
So that's one bit of functionality that's not going to work right now, but we will get that set up here in just a bit. Um, okay. So our site is working, but you don't want to actually leave it like this. So I'm going to go back to our terminal here. Now we don't actually want to run this using the Django server like we've done here. This was just for testing that everything worked so far, but now uh, let's kill that server that we were just running. And now we want to run a server that's more reliable. So, you know, something like Apache or Nginx or something like that. Um, now in this video, I'm going to use Apache, but there's different options available to you. And let me actually minimize our browser there. Okay. Okay. So there are a couple of things that we need to install here. First, we need to install Apache, which is going to be our web server. And then we're going to install something called mod whiskey. Now whiskey, which is WSGI stands for web service gateway interface. And that's what allows our web server, in this case, Apache, it allows our web server to talk to Python and to talk to our web application, which in this case is Django. So we need to install and configure both of those. So first I'll install Apache. So I'll say, uh, actually, let me go back to my root directory here by typing CD so that we have some more space here. Um, so now I'm going to say sudo apt get install, and this is going to be Apache 2. So let's run that. Okay, and once that's installed, I'm going to clear my screen here. And now let's install mod whiskey. So to do that, that is uh, sudo apt get install. And this is lib apache2 dash mod dash whiskey dash pi3. I always have to look that up. I can never remember these long package names. So I think that should work. Let me run that and hit yes. Okay, so it looks like that was installed successfully. Um, so now we need to configure our Apache web server. So I'm going to clear my screen. So now let's CD into a uh, directory here in etc uh, Apache 2 sites available. And this directory here is where the Apache configuration files live. So if I do an ls in this directory here, then we can see that there are some default configuration files here. Now I'm going to use one of these configuration files as the starting point for our project's configuration. So I'm just going to copy one of these. So I'll say sudo cp and I will copy that first one. So 000 default and I will copy that into a file called uh, Django underscore project dot conf. And again, sorry for the uh, text scrolling onto multiple lines here. I know that that can make it a little bit more difficult to read, uh, but I have to make a trade off between having the text large enough to where you can read it. But you know, sometimes that uh, makes it harder to read when it goes onto multiple lines like that. Okay, so now we've created this Django project.conf configuration file that is a copy of the default configuration file. So now let's edit it to uh, where it uh, meets the needs for our project. So I'm going to do sudo nano uh, and change that Django project.conf file. Okay, so what we have here is a default configuration file uh, for Apache. Um, now, where it says virtual host. Uh, 80 right here. This 80, it means port 80. So this is what's going to show up on HTTP port. Um, so whenever we go to our uh, IP address in the browser, uh, it's going to follow these rules. So I'm going to scroll down here towards the bottom. All of this stuff is just default standard stuff. So right here before the closing virtual host tag, I'm going to add in a few of our own rules. So first of all, we're going to use an alias to tell Apache to map requests starting with static to our apps static folder. And remember in our project settings, we put this in our projects base directory. So to do this, I'm going to say alias and we want to alias anything that references static. And we want that to go to our projects static directory. Now on my machine, uh, this is located in my home directory and my user is Corey MS. You're going to want to put your user there. My project is called Django underscore project. You're going to put a, want to put your project there. And I put that static folder uh, in my Django project directory. So that is where mine is located. You want to put uh, 
where you put your static directory there. Um, so now we want to give some permissions here. So we're going to say for that directory, oops, sorry, that needs to be capitalized. So we'll say directory and the directory is going to be the same thing that we put here. So I will just try to copy that and paste it. And within that directory tag, uh, we are going to say require all granted. And now we can close out the directory tag. So we will put a forward slash there and directory. And now we want to create another one of these for the media folder as well. So I'm just going to copy that big whole section there and paste that in. And up here where we had static, we want to change these to be media. So I will change this one here to be media. And then here at the end, I will change that to be media as well. And one more place right there. Okay, and now that we have the static and media directories taken care of, uh, next we need to grant access to the uh, WSGI.py file within our project. This ensures that Apache can access our whiskey.py file, uh, which is how our app is actually going to talk to our web server. So to do this, I'm going to scroll down here just a little bit. So to do this, I am going to copy uh, up until this point of this line here and paste this in. But for the directory here, uh, I also want to go one more level deep and I want to go into uh, the Django project directory within our Django project. And that's because that's where that whiskey.py file lives. So now within there, and I'm just going to go ahead and close this off right now so I don't forget later. So within here, we want to uh, create some file tags. So I will say files and that is wsgi.py and I'll also close off that files tag there as well. And within here, we also want to say uh, require all granted. Okay, so we're just about finished up here. Just a couple of more uh, things to add. So next, we're going to add the part that actually handles the WSGI part. So we're going to use uh, the daemon mode for this, and this is recommended in Django's official documentation. So to do this, let me scroll down here just a little bit so we can see this a little better. So to do this, I'm going to put in a tag here called WSGI script alias, and then we are just going to put a forward slash, and then we will do a forward slash home Corey MS. You're going to want to put your user in there. Uh, Django underscore project forward slash Django underscore project forward slash WSGI dot pi. So the first bit here is the base URL path where we want to serve our application. Uh, and in this case, it indicates the root URL. Um, so basically, that means going to the base of our IP address without any extra routes will take us to our Django application. And the second part here is the full path to that WSGI.py file. So once we have that done, now we can specify the daemon process. So I'll say WSGI, D-A-E-M-O-N is how you spell that. Uh, daemon process. And now we can uh, just call this whatever we want. It's uh, just going to be the process. So we'll just call it Django app. And now I can say Python path. Oh, and I don't want any spaces there. So Python path equal to, this is going to be the path to our project directory. So on my machine, that's forward slash home, forward slash Corey MS, forward slash Django project. Again, you put in the path to your Django project there. Um, and now uh, we also need to specify Python dash home. And for Python home, I'm going to say that equals, and this is going to be the location to our virtual environment. So I'm in on my machine that is forward slash home, forward slash Corey MS, forward slash Django underscore project, forward slash V E N V. 
Now, I know that this is a lot of typing and it might be easy to uh, mess something up here or mistype something. So I'm going to uh, take this configuration file once we're done with this video and I'll put this in my GitHub page so that you can compare it to yours uh, to see you know, if you've made any mistakes. Um, okay, so with that said, uh, we only have one more line here to finish up this configuration. So this is going to be WSGI process group. And we want this process group to be equal to this process here that we specified in this daemon process. So I'm just going to uh, type in the same thing there. So Django app is what we name that process. Okay, so hopefully we didn't make any typos there and got everything correct. Um, so I will save this file. So within nano, it's control X, uh, a Y for yes to save, and then just hit enter to keep the same file name. Um, so now I am going to clear my screen and I'm going to CD back to my uh, home directory here so that we have a little bit more typing room. So now let's enable that site through Apache. So to do that, we can say sudo and this is a2en site to enable the site. So that's Apache 2 enable site. And then we want to uh, specify that Django project and I will hit enter there and you can see that it's telling us that to activate the new configuration we need to restart Apache. Uh, we'll do that in just a minute. Um, now I'm also going to disable the default site. So I'm going to say sudo uh, a2 for Apache 2, dis for disable and then site and we will disable that uh, 000, 000 default dot conf. Okay, so now that default site is disabled and our Django project is enabled. Um, okay, so now let's finish up with doing some file permissions here. So there are still a couple of things that we need to change. So right now we have to give Apache access to things like our uh, database because we are right now we're using SQLite. In a future video, we're going to use Postgres, but right now we're still using SQLite. So Apache has to be able to read and write from that SQLite file. And the same goes for our media folder. So if somebody is uploading a picture, then Django has to be able to write to that media folder. So let's do a few different permission updates here. So I'm going to say sudo chown, which changes the owner of a directory or a file. And I'm going to do a colon www-data. That is the uh, Apache user there. And we want to uh, change the permission in Django project db dot SQL light three is the name of our database file. So what this is going to do is it's going to uh, make Apache the group on that file. So if I run that, then now Apache is the group owner of that file. And now I'm going to change the permissions. So I'll say uh, sudo ch mod and the permissions that we want here are 664. So again, that's a six for the owner, a six for the group and a four for everybody else. A four is uh, read permissions. And I want to um, give permissions to Django project db.sqlite3. Okay, so I also want that www data group to own the Django project folder itself as well. So I'm going to say sudo ch own, and we will put in a colon www data, and we will uh, change the ownership of the Django project itself. So I will run that. Now, if we do an ls-la, then we'll be able to see these permissions. So if we see Django project here, we can see that now Core EMS is the owner, but it is now www data is the group owner. So that's what that ch own command is doing. Okay, so now I'm going to clear the screen here. Now let's do those same things for the media folder. So I'm going to say sudo ch o w n. And now we're going to do a dash R for recursive. Um, and again, we're going to do a colon www dash data. And we want uh, to give permissions here on the media folder. So I'll say for Django project forward slash media. So I'll run that. And that will allow Apache to uh, actually write uploaded media to that media folder. And now let's change the permissions here. So I'm going to do a sudo chmod dash R. And we will do a 775 
and we will do Django project media again and run that. Okay, so I know that this has been a long video so far, but we are just about finished up with uh, the final deployment of our Django application. There are just some final changes that we need to make before we go live with our website. So the first thing is that we need to move sensitive information to a config file. Now, uh, I was using environment variables in the development of this application, but in Apache, environment variables can be a little tricky to work with, and you have to change the WSGI Python file and things like that. Uh, since this video has already been long enough and we've done so much configurations, I think it would be a lot easier to just do a config file for this sensitive information uh, instead of doing environment variables. So the sensitive information that I'm talking about is going to be like our secret key for our application and our email username and our email password that we use to reset our password in the application. And in the future, this is also where we are going to add our database username and database password and things like that when we use Postgres. So I'm just going to create a config.json file on our system that holds that secret information. So I'm going to put this in, so I'll do a sudo touch, which will create a file. And I'm going to put this in the etc directory, and I'm just going to call this config.json. Now, if you have, you know, multiple applications on the same server, then you can have the name of your application dash config.json or something like that uh, to differentiate between their different applications. So I'm going to run that to create that file. And now I'm going to grab our secret key from our application. So to get the secret key, I'm going to say sudo nano, and that is within Django project, Django project settings.py. If I run that and scroll down just a little bit here, then it is close to the top of our settings.py file. And you can see here, it says security warning, keep the secret key used in production secret. So, if you're using something like Git, then you don't want to, uh, you know, have this pushed up to GitHub or something like that. You want to either use an environment variable or load it in from a config file like we're going to do here. So I'm going to uh, copy this secret key, copy, and I will now erase this here. And we will add this back in in just a second. But for now, I'm going to... Uh, save that settings file. And now let's open up that config.json file that we just created. So I'm going to say sudo nano, and we put that in dash etc config.json. Now this is empty right now, but to create this JSON file, I'm going to put in opening and closing braces there. And now I will put in a key for the secret key, and I will give that a value. And this is going to be within quotes here. Now we're going to paste in that secret key that we copied from before. Now we're also going to put other secret or sensitive information in here as well. Uh, so our email user that we use to uh, send emails through our email service, we can put that email address in here. And we also need our email password. So I'll say email underscore pass is what we called it in our application. And I will put that in here as well. Now you're going to want to put your email username and your email password that we used in this series. Uh, now I'm going to use my own. I'm not going to show you uh, my email username and password here for obvious reasons. I don't want you to be able to log into my email. Um, but so I'm going to exit out of this um, file now. But before I actually run this live, I'll fill this in off of the recording uh, so that we can see that it works properly. So now I'm going to save this file. So control X, Y to save and then enter. And now we want to update our settings.py file uh, and pass in the values from that config file. So I'm going to run that same command that we ran earlier, sudo nano, and we want to run nano on our settings.py file. So I will run that. Now here at the top of our settings.py file, I'm just going to import JSON. Now I used JSON for my configuration, but if you're more comfortable using YAML or something like that, then you can definitely use that as well. Um, so now uh, here at the top, I'm just going to load in this config file. So I'm going to say with open, and we are going to open uh, that file. So that was in forward slash etc config 
config.json, and we will open that as a config underscore file. And within here, I will say config is equal to json.load, and we will load in that config file. Oh, make sure that I spell that correctly. We will load in that config file. And I think that nano is putting in more spaces here uh, than what I'm used to when I hit tab. So instead, I'm just going to use spaces. So I'll put in four spaces there instead. Okay, so with that config file loaded, these should be the last changes that we need to make uh, in our settings.py file. So here for our secret key, uh, remember, we loaded in that JSON file. And JSON, whenever you load something in and use JSON.load, it loads that in as a dictionary. So now our config variable should be a dictionary with all of our sensitive information. So for our secret key here, I'll just say uh, config and access that secret key key of that config dictionary. And that config variable that we are using there, uh, let me show you just one more time. That is what we set right here. That is that variable. That is the JSON that we loaded in. So let me go back down to our secret key. And now that we've set the secret key to that uh, sensitive information, now we also need to set debug equal to false. You don't want debug equal to true on your production machine uh, because anytime there's an error, it's going to give uh, way too much information to people and it could, you know, expose uh, other flaws in your system to uh, people who could hack into your system or something like that. So you always want debug turned to false in production. And you can see that Django says that here too. They say security warning, don't run with debug turned on in production. Okay, and we are almost done. Let me scroll down to the very bottom here where I set my uh, email username and email password information. So that's at the very bottom of the settings.py file. And you can see here, uh, we were using environment variables. Uh, that's what we used earlier in the series whenever we added this functionality. But now I'm using that config file instead. So instead of os.environ.get, I'm just gonna say config.get. And we will keep that as email user. And instead of os.environ.get, that is config.get. And now I will save our settings.py file by hitting control X, Y to save and enter. Okay, so now that we've updated our settings.py file, let me clear my screen here. Now at this point, I'm going to pause the video and I'm gonna go back into my configuration.json file and I'm gonna put in my uh, uh, email username and my email password. And then I'm going to uh, start the video back up so that whenever we actually test this in production, then we can see that uh, the emails actually work when we try to reset our password. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Okay, so I went back into my configuration file and I put in my information for my email username and password. Uh, you'll have to go in and do your information there. Uh, but now that should be it. Like we should be ready to go. It should be fully deployed at this point. Um, so now all we need to do is a couple more commands here. So we want to uh, disallow the... Um, port 8000 that we were using to test earlier with our firewall. So what I'm going to do is a sudo ufw delete that allow. So delete allow on port 8000. And so we can see that the rule was deleted. And now we want to allow HTTP traffic. So I'm going to say sudo ufw allow HTTP forward slash TCP. So I'll run that. Okay, and with that done, now we can restart our Apache server and it should be good to go. So I will say sudo service Apache, Apache 2 restart. So let's restart that and I'll clear my screen. Okay, so at this point, if we did everything correctly, then our site should now be live. So if we pull back up our browser and 
here before we were at port 8000. If I try to reload that page at port 8000 now, it shouldn't uh, give me anything. So we can see up here it's spinning. There's stuff on the screen here, but that's just from before. If we let this wait long enough, it'll say the site can't be reached. Uh, but if we take off that port 8000, hopefully we didn't have any typos in our configurations or settings, and it should work. Okay, so we can see that this looks promising. We kind of have our website here. So now let's test the functionality. So let's try to first create a user. So I'm gonna create a user called deployed user and I'll do an email at deployed user at test.com, put in a sample password here and confirm that. So sign up. Okay, so we got an error here when we tried to create that user. Um, so that means that somewhere along the lines, we uh, either forgot a step or we made a typo somewhere. Um, now, if uh, debug was set to true in our settings, then there would be a lot more information here as to what exactly went wrong. Uh, but since debug is set to false, we can see that this is a very vague error. It just says server error 500. Now, like I said before, you never want debug set to true when you're working with a live website, because if you have an error like this, you don't want uh, just any random person to see all that detailed error information, because it can give a lot of information about your backend server and leave you more uh, vulnerable to future attacks. But if we have an error like this, then how do we go about debugging this? Um, well, if you're on a live server or working on a live website, then I would recommend setting up a test server and testing everything there where you can set debug equal to true uh, that's not open to the public. Now, since our website here isn't you know, available for everyone just yet, we don't even have a domain name, I'm just gonna go back to our site and set debug equal to true so that we can see what this is doing. But if I was actually working on a real website, then I would probably set up a completely different test server or maybe just open this up on a specific port and then set debug equal to true. But since this isn't uh, completely uh, live yet, then it's okay to do it this way. So I'm going to say sudo nano and we will open back up our settings here. So settings.py and I will scroll down here and set debug equal to true. Oh, that has to be capitalized there. And I will save that file. And now let's restart our Apache server. So to do that, we can say sudo service Apache to restart. So now if we go back to our page and try this again, so I'll fill out everything that I just did. So deployed user, deployed user at test.com and then put in a password. So let's sign up. And now we have more detailed error information. So we can see here that it says uh, attempt to write read only database. Um, so that leads me to believe that it is a permissions error with our database. So if we go back to our server, then let me clear this out. If I do an ls-la, then we can see the permissions here. So I'm gonna do that on our project. So our db.sqlite, this is our database file. So uh, this is the Apache group here and the group can write to that database. So that doesn't seem to be the problem. If I do an ls-la in my current directory, um, then we can see that we have the Apache group owns this directory, uh, but it doesn't have write permissions. So the parent directory also has to have write permissions for that database. So that is most likely the problem there. So if instead I say uh, sudo chmod 775 on Django project, uh, remember this is the user here, uh, this is the group. So this will give the group uh, read, write, and execute permissions there with that seven in the second spot. So if I run that, and now again, let me restart the Apache server. And now let's try testing our website again. 
So hopefully this will work um, and we don't have to make any more changes. So deployed user, deployed user at test.com, fill out the password there and sign up. Okay, and it looks like that worked. Okay, so now let's also test all of the other functionality as well. So let's log in with that deployed user that we just created. Okay, so we can log in, so that's good. We can go to our profile and let's try to create a post. So I'll say test, post, test, post. Okay, so that works. Let's try to update a post, test, update post. That works. Let's delete one. That works as well. Let's go to our profile and try to upload a new picture. Okay, so that is working for us. Um, let's try to log out. Okay, so that is working. Uh, lastly, let's try the admin page. Uh, let's see, Corey MS is my admin user. Okay, so my admin page is working as well. Uh, so lastly, I'm going to go back to the site and I'm going to log out. Now, the one thing that wasn't working before was the password reset. But like I said, if uh, you went in and you put your email, username and password into that configuration file that we loaded into our settings, then this should now work. So I'm going to try this out. I'm going to uh, send a reset password to my email address. And we can see here that it looks like it worked. It said an email has been sent with instructions to reset your password. Now I actually have my email opened up in another browser over here. If I reload my email, then we can see that we have an email that says password reset on. And right now we just have the IP address. If we had a domain name here, then that would be the domain name. So let's click on that password reset link and we can see that that looks like it works. So I'm going to put in a new password here and then try to sign in with that new password. So that was Corey MS as the username and then I'll put in the new password. Okay, so all of that functionality seems to be working. So now we have a fully deployed, fully functional uh, Django application that we deployed to a Linux server. Now, if you are deploying your own Django application, then I would also recommend uh, going to Google and typing in uh, Django deployment checklist. And the first result should be from their website. They have a deployment checklist on their website here of things that you can go down through and check. Uh, so if we just kind of scroll through here, um, then we can see a couple of things. So like critical settings, secret key, the secret key should be either an environment variable or from a file and we put it in a file. So that's good. Uh, you should have, uh, you should never enable debug in production. We have had that turned off. Actually, that's uh, good that I, thought of that uh, because uh, we actually need to go back and disable that. Um, so I won't do it right now just to wind this video down, uh, but definitely go back in and set debug equal to false once you're done debugging your application. And you can see that there's just all kinds of different checks that we can make. So here's the allowed host. There's some stuff about caches and databases. So it says database connection parameters should be exactly like your secret key. Either put them in uh, environment variables or in a configuration file, just like we did. Um, so things like that, this checklist will give you a good bit of things to go through and check and make sure that you uh, did everything properly for deploying your application to production. Okay, so let me go back to the blog here and go back here to the main page. Um, okay, so now we've deployed our Django application to our server and it's accessible through the IP address of our server. Now there's still a lot more that we could do with this in the future if you're interested. Uh, so right now we only have an IP address, but if you want, then I can also walk through uh, the process of buying a domain name and how to get the domain name to go to this server that we've set up. Uh, we could also see how to add SSL certificates uh, so that we can have an HTTPS domain. Uh, that's actually something
something that I still need to do for my personal website as well. Um, now, after I record this video, I'm going to uh, delete the Linode server. So if you go to this uh, IP address that I have here, then you probably won't see this website that we just deployed. And that is why it's because I deleted it. Um, I'll spin up uh, another server with these same parameters uh, whenever we're ready to record future videos on this blog. Actually, let me go ahead and delete that server right now. Uh, that way you can see how to do it if you were following along and using Linode as well and you want to delete the server also so that you're not charged for it. Um, so what we can do is I'll just log in here uh, using my account. It logged me out because of how much time we were away. Now here is the server that we created in this tutorial, this Django server. Now to delete this, it's just as simple as clicking on your Linode and going to settings. And then in settings, we can come down here to delete Linode. And if we click on delete, now it gives you a warning here that deleting a Linode server will result in permanent data loss. So everything that we did to our server is going to be lost. So I will click delete and then it'll ask us if we're sure, click delete. And that server is gone. So it's no longer charging us money for that Linode server. Now, like I said at the beginning of this video, Linode was actually kind enough to sponsor this tutorial. And I've used Linode for many years and have recommended them to people long before I ever had any sponsors. So if you get a chance, I would highly recommend giving them a shot. So like we saw in this video, they have this really nice new uh, cloud manager that makes uh, spinning up a server fast and easy. Uh, you can also choose from available images or you can even upload your own custom image if that's something that you'd like to do. And if you're doing something that is fairly common, then they even have stack scripts that allow you to spin up a server with all of the relevant software ready to go. Um, so for example, if you're making a WordPress site or something like that, then you can simply choose their WordPress stack script that spins up a server with WordPress ready to go. So if you were to do something like that, you would come in here and go to create Linode. We could go to create from stack script, go to Linode stack, stack scripts, and we can see that they have a WordPress server here that would already have all of that ready to go as soon as it spins up. So it's things like that that make this a really nice platform to work on. Um, they also have nine data centers around the world so far, and they have two more set to open in 2019. So no matter where you are, you should be able to spin up a server close to your audience. So if you want to check them out, then feel free to use my referral link in the description section below, and you can get $20 of credit applied to your account to try them out. Okay, so with that said, that is going to do it for this video. Uh, hopefully now you have a pretty good idea for how you can deploy a Django application to your own Linux server. Uh, like I said before, this option takes a little more effort than some other options out there, but having your own private server gives you so much more flexibility and room for growth with your application. And doing it this way also provides terrific knowledge for learning more about backend Linux systems, which is really sought after with uh, a lot of people in the industry. And uh, it's one of those things where if you have it on a job application, it's really going to look good. But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. And if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.